Good morning. Jim, can you hear me back there? Can you hear me? Okay. I am so confused. <laughs> uh, we will figure out all of the, it won't be this crowded. And we'll probably put a little more over in there than we will over here. This is just a little crowded over here. But, uh, Ed? Yes, sir, I wanted to ask you. The clock's not up there. You want me to give you the I-5? Yeah, please. That, that clock wasn't working anyhow, so it doesn't matter. Thank you. But we are glad you're here. And uh, studying the book, have some folks back. This table up here has been playing hooky now for about three months. <laughs> I did notice one thing. You couldn't have the same table, but you, sat, you got the same group. <laughs> <laughs> You're not very, you're not very fruit basket turnover. And when we get ready to go for lunch, we're going to go around this way and create a loop so we won't have to go through all that construction or all that length outside and back in. Uh, Nevin Allwine over here is going to be our glorious leader I chose him because he can't walk fast. <laughs> and you can stay up with him. Okay. Some prayer requests. And, and one, Peter Marshall, who is a famous name, uh, he and his wife have joined our church. I've told her, if your name's Catherine, I've got a real problem with reincarnation. <laughs> but her name's not Catherine. Needs a car to go to work. He's working here at the church. So if you have a, an automobile that you want to dump on somebody, if you want to sell, I have his phone number where you can call him. So if you'll just come and and let me know and get the number, and then I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a used car salesman. AJ's the used car salesman over here, not me. And so I will uh, let him know. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say about that. And then we have a request here. Some of you probably know Jim Dorschel. Jim Dorschel is having an aortic valve replacement this morning. Now that no longer is invasive surgery. They go through the groin just like they do with a stent. Uh, but it's still, when you mess with your heart, it's still serious. I don't care how they do it. So pray for Jim Dorsal. He's having that done this morning. Others of our church family who are uh, in sickness, having a difficult time, uh, remember to pray for them as they come to your mind. Uh, pray for all this mess that we'll get through this soon. Uh, this, by the way, is going to be a new lobby to give us a place for fellowship because we can't do that in the hallway out there now. It just gets too crowded too quickly. So there's going to be a bigger entrance, going to be a ramp up to the auditorium. It's going to be a new lobby, so it's going to be nice. You'll like it when it's done. You won't like it until it's done, but you'll like it when it's done. All right. Let's look at review sheet number five. Let's pray together. Our Father, we pray for Jim Dorschel, that you would bless him 
Bless the skillful hands of the doctors that wait upon his needs. For those of our church family who are having difficulties, I pray that you would bless them. Some battling cancer, some battling COVID, some battling things that they don't know yet what it is. The doctor's still trying to find out. And so I just thank you, Heavenly Father, that you're the great physician and that we can trust you. So we place them in your hands today and ask your continued blessings to be upon them. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Review number five. Matching. Book of Ephesians. Number one, Now, I want you to look at number one and number ten because they are interchangeable. Redemption. C. Cost. Christ. Number 10. Redemption. F. Exodus. Power. Redemption has two features. One is it cost something every time. Anytime you redeem something, it costs something. Some of you remember the what, green stamps, red stamps, blue stamps. And you had to take them to the redemption center. That means you gave your stamps and they gave you a lamp or whatever you wanted. <laughs> it costs something. Redemption costs something. Redemption also has to have power. I use as the example the Exodus. Redeeming God's people out of bondage for, had been there for 400 years and suddenly they're coming out of bondage and some estimate as many as four million people. That's a bunch of people to get across the desert and go to the promised land. And it took power. Part of that power was seen when they got to the Red Sea. It opened up. They went by on dry land. So as a result, power is also a quality of redemption as well as cost. Number two, salvation reality, H, conversion. You are converted. God's love, I. Don't try to explain it, just embrace it. Enjoy it. Man of sorrows, J, Philip Bliss. If you don't know that song, get you a songbook. Memorize it. What a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Savior. That's a wonderful song. You need to know it. Renewed life. B. The new birth. New birth. Life. A. Is in the blood. I was reading that again this morning. In the blood. Sophia, D, wisdom, wisdom. Dispensation, E, administration, administration. Prudence, G, practical understanding of truth. Prudence. Who was the president? Use uh, George H. W. Bush. That was one of his favorite words. Not prudent. That's not prudent. Uh, I haven't heard it since. Prudence. And then uh, number 10 we've already seen. Number two, inheritance. What do we inherit when we come to Christ? Number one, eternal Life, number one. We inherit eternal life. John 3. God so loved the world. He uses everlasting life just before he used eternal life. Number two. The gathering together of his people. Uh, I probably would put a dash and put rapture, rapture, the rapture of the church.
Number three, life with the saints. Life with the saints. Number four, the promised land. John Phillips has a wonderful outline on the Father's will. Number three, the Father's will, Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. 1, verses 3 through 6. The Son's work, Ephesians 1, 7 through 12. The Spirit's witness, 1, 13 and 14. And I just sort of mentioned this in passage. I thought I wanted to be sure you get it in your notes. Liberal theology, as I classify it. Now, it's more than this simple classification. But here are the three things I find wrong with liberalism. One, they believe too much about man. Man can lift himself up by his own bootstraps. Why does he need a savior? Why does he need to be redeemed? What's heaven all about? What do you mean new birth? And so they bring too much about man. Number two, they believe too little about Jesus. Good man, even a prophet. No, he's more than that. He's the son of God. He's the God-man, one and only God-man, Jesus Christ. And number three, they have no idea what they believe about the Bible, subject to change day by day. Somebody finds something new and the whole Bible gets ripped out again. Listen, folks, now I know I'm probably to the right of the Ayatollah Khomeini, I am just about as right as you can get. But let me tell you, I believe the Bible is truth. And I believe it's the word of God. Do I understand all of it? No. i tell you what bothers me is what I do understand. It's not what I don't understand. Am I living up to the potential that God has given me as I understand the word of God? And I, am I being the person God wants me to be as I understand the Word of God? And so the Bible is God's Word. And then on the back side, God's three elections. God's three elections. The election of Israel to be His people. The election of Israel to be His people. Now, that's God's choice. That's whom he chose, Israel. Number two, there is also the vocational election. I am elected by God to preach the gospel. Now, I'm going to talk today about the mysteries of, of the eternal things of God. That's one of them. Why would God choose me to do something like this? So the eternal, that call, vocational calling. Number three, the sovereign election of God. God chooses whom he will. Now that's not a doctrine of rejection. That's a doctrine of election. God chooses whom he will. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure it does. What is the test of orthodoxy? According to According to me, I'm sorry. I looked at the wrong one. I I gave you some things that's not on your sheet. I, I turned one too many. 
<laughs> but it's good stuff, so go ahead and put it down. The test of orthodoxy. Where did they put Jesus in what they teach and preach? Where did they put Jesus in what they teach and preach? That, for me, is a test of orthodoxy. Now, when I hear a preacher say that there's more than one way to heaven, you just choose whichever path you want to take. Uh, dealing with a man now that's a Christian Buddhist. And you got to be one or the other. It can't be both. Yeah, there's, sure there's some good things about Buddhism. <coughs> the meditative quality is a good thing. Most of us don't do enough meditation. Moi, I don't do enough meditation. I do a lot of praying, but I don't do a lot of meditation. Just ruminating. It's the same thing. Ruminate is the same thing as chewing the cud. If you've ever been around cattle, when are they most docile? When they're cooing, chewing the cud, they're most docile and peaceful. Meditation. All right. Now you got me straight. Thank you for getting me straight. Don't ever hesitate. Now I want to say just a few more things about uh, this idea of wisdom and the youth. Sophia, Sophia is right thinking. I, I told you earlier it was, it's right thinking. It's useful. And why is it important that God's people have right thinking? Because right thinking leads to right action. You can't fill your mind with cruddy stuff and expect to act right. So right thinking leads to right action. Now, does it automatically lead to right action? No, it's a decision. You have to come to a decision. But when you give your mind to Christ as Christ gave his mind to us, that's what he says in Philippians, let this mind be in you. Then that's your disposition as well. And so this right action that comes. Prudence is the effective use of that right action and that wisdom. It's the effective use. Now he also talks about the mystery. And this idea of the mystery of God. Let me just mention two or three things about it. It's used 28 times. Mystery is used 28 times in the New Testament. 21 of those times it's used by the Apostle Paul. So Paul has this concept of the mystery. And I, I just started jotting some things down about the mystery that you find in Scripture. Mystery number one. Why would God allow me to approach him? Why would he expect me to talk to him and pray? That's a mystery to me. When you have a sovereign God who's omniscient, omnipresent, omnicompetent, all of these things, it's a mystery to me why he'd want to talk to us. But he does. Number two, there's the mystery of the revelation. And by the way, that mystery, let me, let me take that just one step further. You must always maintain, when you're dealing with the scripture, you have to maintain the knowable and the unknowable. Now, folks, just get in your mind. I don't care who says it. There's some things we don't know. Everybody wants to know, when is Jesus coming again? Do you know the best answer you can give? I don't know. 
Well, the world looks like it's getting in a mess. It's getting in a knot. It's worse and it's worse and it's worse and worse. It's gone downhill. It's always been going downhill. Rarely has the world ever gone uphill. Great revivals lasted for a while. We're ready for another one. But I'm, I'm telling you, you just may as well admit. Well, preacher, what, how's the rapture going? How is he going to take these folks who are eaten by a lion in Africa? Uh, how is he going to resurrect them? I don't know. We don't have to know. I, I don't know. How, how is God going to take the deterioration of the body and, and then put the body back together again? I don't know. But you know what? I believe he is. He's going to talk about the power of the resurrection again today. So this idea of the mystery, the knowable and the unknowable. Approaching God. We approach God more than just in prayer. We approach him in meditation. We even approach him in reason. We try to understand through prayer. God, give me an answer. Now, most of the time when he gives us an answer, it's not the one we wanted. Or it may be different than what we wanted. But give us an answer, a reason. And I jotted down for some reason, I believe in the Lord's Supper, there is a great reminder of the connection we have with the Heavenly Father. This do in remembrance of me. I don't know how. I never did figure it out as a pastor, and I certainly haven't figured it out as a staff member. But I've always felt like that we just tacked it on. There, there should be a time. There should be a time when the Lord's Supper just absolutely amazes us that Jesus would take time to say, this is my body. To the extent that some believe that the wafer is actually absolutely transformed into the real body and blood of Christ, which means the more you take it, the more you become like him. Now, I don't believe that. It's called transubstantiation. I don't believe that. But I believe we need to remember what Jesus did for us. And so even that. Now, another, in this idea of mystery, it's revelation vocabulary. There's always a mystery about revelation, what God seeks to reveal. And he reveals some to some and some things to others. Now, I, I've been in this long enough, I've heard it all. God told me to tell you. I said, well, that's interesting. God didn't tell me to listen. <laughs> listen, folks, there is no new revelation about Jesus. When he said it's finished, it, it's finished. There's no new revelation about Jesus. And so the, these, I start to say these birds, that's not a good word. These folks who try to make a buzzing in the ear, the word of God, I have a real problem with that, I have to confess. I don't believe God's going to tell other people something about me that he wouldn't tell me if I ask him. So, this idea of revelation. The mystery of the gospel itself. Just the mystery of the gospel itself. Go preach the gospel. 
that people might be saved. Just the mystery of the gospel itself. Why Jesus came down, lived, and died. Just the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of his will for our life. His will. I, when I thought about this, I thought, how many of you are living in the same city in which you were born? How many of you? you you're living in Jacksonville, you were born in Jacksonville. That's about maybe one-fourth. And that's, that's about one-fourth. A second question, how many have you always, how many have you always lived in Jacksonville where you were born? Just about 10 people. Why is it God's will that you're here rather than where you were born? Now, I know why I'm here. Uh, I understand that. I couldn't go back to West Virginia to live if I wanted to, and I don't want to. <laughs> what I'm saying, it, who said, oh, it's a beautiful place to be from. <laughs> but my point is this. Look around. Folks are different. And yet his will is we're here together as a family. Is that not a mystery to you? Maybe it's just a mystery to me. Maybe it's just a mystery to me. God took us from took me from West Virginia to Washington DC to San Jose, California, to Phoenix, Arizona, to Fort Worth, Texas, to Sulphur Springs, Texas, to Shreveport, Louisiana, and finally the promised land, Florida. <laughs> yeah. my, my point is this. It's a mystery why God would do that. It's a mystery. When I came here on staff, almost seven years now, it'll be seven years, uh, April the 2nd. Pastor wanted me to come on April the 1st. I said, no, <laughs> I'm not coming on April the 1st. <laughs> you do know that that's the atheist that's the only holiday atheists have, April 1st. Now, some of you will think about that, and tonight you'll say, oh, I get it. <laughs> so his will becomes a mystery to us, at least his will for me. The mystery of the church. Do you know every time you come to church, somebody's going to want you to do something? Stand up. You can be seated. Here comes the offering plate. Will you teach a class? Will you do this? Every time you come to church, we want you to do something. No other. You would not belong to any other organization that did that. That's the mystery of the church. The parts of the body come together to form the body of Christ. The mystery. The mystery of iniquity. That's the best way I can say it. Why do they not see what they're doing to themselves? Iniquity has to do with the intensifying of sin to the place that it gets into your life in such a way you can't get out of it except by the grace of God. It's a mystery. I have a niece who got strung out on drugs as a teenage girl 
Every time I talk to her, I think, dear God, she's back on. Why would she do that to herself? She knows what it's going to do to her. I told one of my friends that, and he said, well, I can tell you why they do it. Euphoric recall. It felt so good, and I feel so bad. Euphoric recall. But can't she see it's taking her down the tube? Down the tube. Okay, that's enough about mystery. I hope you understand what I'm saying. There's just, there's just a mystery about all of this. And that's, the, that's part of the joy of it. Not having to understand all of it and rejoicing in the knowable along with the unknowable. And I have to tell you, I know no more today than I did yesterday because I read my Bible. And I prayed last night. I read my Bible last night. I read 10 pages every night in the New Testament. Try to read it through at least three to four times every year. And you ought to also, if you're not reading your Bible, I'm going to say this again in a moment. If you're not reading your Bible, you're not going to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You're just not. I don't know how else to say it. Well, I'm a good person. I'm glad that you're a good person. Jesus didn't die to make us good. He died to make us alive so that we could imitate him. All right. All right, that's the mystery of iniquity. Well, the last one. No one can be saved apart from the word of truth. Now, this is talking about the sealing of the Holy Spirit. No, Ken, I can get it, thanks. <laughs> I told you last time I'd bring this and show you. This is an honorary doctor's degree that I received from the university system of Haiti. You can't read a word on it. You can, think, you can make out some words. I told you we waited for the secretary to come. They wouldn't give it to me until he came because he had to put the seal to make it authentic. Now, I'm bragging about this also, by the way, and God will forgive me for bragging. This is probably one of the trophies about my life that I love best, to be recognized for work in a foreign country that made a difference in the foreign country. So, Ken, I'll, and Ken made the frame for this, by the way. Yeah, Ken made the frame for that. Now, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He seals us. He authenticates us. He authenticates us as he comes into our life. The sealing of God's elect. Now, the Holy Spirit is seen in Scripture in a number of ways. I'm going to mention three and then probably talk most about one. Number one, he, I use the word thunder. He thunders his message through the prophets, the preachers, the teachers. He authenticates the message through the prophets. John the Baptist being the bridge prophet. Do you realize for 400 years, I think I'm saying that right, in the interbiblical period for 400 years, there was no voice of a prophet found in Israel. No voice of a prophet. And when John came on the scene, he was more like Old Testament prophet than New Testament prophet. In the Old Testament, not all prophets were writing prophets. Uh, there is no book of Elijah, the fiery prophet of God that called down the fire on Mount Carmel. Hero of mine. I'd love to call down the fire. Elijah, the prophet of God, 
in the battle with the, the, the prophets of the grove and the prophets of Baal. He calls down the power of God. Thunders through the preachers. Now, his methodology might have been different, but his theology was the same as mine. And that is, God hears and God acts. And so he was doing God's will, and God blessed his will. So he thunders the message. Number two, at Pentecost, he crashed into history. The Holy Spirit crashed into history. Some folks would say he turned the world upside down. I say he tried to turn the world right side up. And that's what crashed. You'd hear Peter saying, This same Jesus whom you crucified is both Savior and Lord. And you're the one who put him to death. And what happened to Simon Peter? He got to go to jail. Voiced what he knew to be the will of God. What he knew to be the gospel. And so he crashed into the world. Now, number three is where I want to camp for the rest of the time. We'll talk about the Holy Spirit. He abides daily for us. He abides daily for us to give us proper walk, proper purpose, A proper promise. And one of the major things that the Holy Spirit does, and we don't even talk about much, most, much, He gives us hope. He gives us hope. And every psychiatrist or psychologist or wannabe psychiatrist and psychologist tell me that the greatest malady in America today is hopelessness. That that's the greatest malady in the world today is hopelessness. Now, I hope that doesn't qualify you, that you have hope. Hope is built on two things. It's built on expectation, expectation, and promise. Expectation and promise. Now you cannot, once you're saved and you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, you cannot lose the Holy Spirit from your life. But you can relegate His influence to a small corner of your life. You can't lose Him but you can relegate him to where you're not walking properly. You're not talking properly. You don't believe the promises of God. You're shallow in your hope. And, and don't look at me so spiritually. All of us have been there one time or another where there comes a sense of hopelessness. And, and even then, you know it's wrong, but you've relegated the power in your life to sustain a high level of hope. So I guess my appeal to you, don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Spirit, not the confused spirit. Don't be afraid. Oh, if I get involved with the Holy Spirit, I'm going to speak in tongues. Not necessarily. I don't think at all. I think this is what Paul meant when he wrote 13th chapter of, of 1 Corinthians. Now we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part is done away. Where there is 
prophecy, it shall fail. Where there is, where there are tongues, they shall cease. Where there is knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come. Now, if God decides for someone to speak in tongues, that's their business. But don't expect me to be sympathetic with it. And for sure, and I got into a buzzsaw as executive director of Florida Baptist over this issue of, of tongues. A buzzsaw. We had a Baptist preacher in a Baptist church who had a session on Sunday nights to teach people how to speak in tongues. Listen to me. If I'm going to speak in tongues, you ain't going to teach me. It's going to come from above. It's going to come from above. I believe the day of tongues is over. That's personal conviction. Now, you don't have to hold that same conviction, then that's all right. You have a right to be wrong. <laughs> no, I'm being serious. I know, I know what I believe, and that's part of it. Now, let me walk on. I don't want to get bogged down in that. I jotted down, I, I'm going to read this to you because I think it's good. He seals us not so we can escape the hazards of life. He seals us not for us to escape the hazards of life, but to make us permanent in salvation. To make us permanent in salvation. Just another way of saying, I believe in eternal security. Once you're saved, you're saved. But once you're saved, you're saved. Oh, the other? Okay. He seals us not to escape the hazards of life. We still have to contend with life. Not to escape the hazards of life, but to make salvation permanent in our lives. The Holy Spirit, we cannot understand all that happens following Pentecost without some knowledge of the Holy Spirit. We cannot understand the Bible, the Word of God, without the Holy Spirit. He guides us. I didn't get along as far as I thought I would. Major work of the Holy Spirit today is gauged by love and fellowship. Love and fellowship. And fellowship is more than cookies and Kool-Aid. And that's where we'll pick up. Well, I've got a couple more minutes. The Holy Spirit, if you're doing bullet points, the Holy Spirit never works apart from Jesus. Never works apart from Jesus. In fact, some of the theology I hear about the Holy Spirit would embarrass the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would not talk about himself, He'd talk about Jesus. Never separated from the work of Jesus. Everything about the ministry of the Holy Spirit is related 
to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Everything, not just some, everything, everything. The Holy Spirit is always, always significant in revelation and teaching. The newest scripture, I think I've just about got it memorized. John 14, did I tell you this earlier? John 14, 26 and 27. The Comforter who will come, the Comforter who is the Holy Spirit, will be sent by the Father to teach you all things. Now that's, but then this part, for my age, this part is really good. And to bring to your remembrance everything I've spoken to you. Isn't it good? That you can call upon the Holy Spirit to bring to your remembrance. And it's amazing. And here's where meditation comes in sometimes also. It's amazing when you get to thinking about something, how much more thinking about you have to do of things associated with that, which you were thinking. Does that make sense? I'm thinking about this and suddenly this happened too out of that experience. And this experiential knowledge that you have and this wisdom, this Sophia that grows out of you you just simply are absolutely amazed that he calls to your attention. Uh, we missed, you said always significant, and then we missed the rest of that. Always significant in the act of revelation. In the act of revelation. I think I'm going to get someone to come and teach us a class of how to quick, take quick notes. <laughs> oh, you don't want to slow me down, believe me. We never would get through the book. All right. That's where we'll stop today, folks. I'll have just a little more to say about the Holy Spirit, but I, I want to get over into this concept of prayer that uh, Dr. Drumwright, I, I went back and read his notes and I just remember when he taught the class and came to this part says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. Isn't that an interesting phrase? The eyes of your heart. So Dr. Drumwright says, Humanly, the older you get, the less eyesight you have. Spiritually, the older you get, the better your eyesight should become. So we're going to talk about the eyes of your heart. Yes, Ed?